Uh, okay, Dr. Pagani. Uh, he said, uh, ready for you? Yeah, hold on. See if I can share this. this should be it. Okay. Yeah, it is working. Okay. So let's introduce. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so we had our grand runs today. Uh, we had a, a very special guest. In this case, is uh, from our home. Uh, it's a tour uh, from Baroni. He is a faculty member uh, in uh, Sony Town State. He uh, basically is uh, more into the uh, research aspect, but he uh, works in uh, stroke. Uh, Dr. Uh, Barone, he's uh, from Syracuse. He actually, he has a PhD uh, in uh, biopsychology for Syracuse University. He actually worked for a long time in the private industry. Uh, and then uh, after 25 years, uh, and uh, he decided to uh, join back again to uh, the academy. Uh, he's, uh, thanks to uh, uh, our chairman, he uh, came to SUNY Down State and he started a basic research uh, lab in a stroke. And he has been in a SUNY Down State uh, for over 13 years. He uh, is uh, involved in uh, the graduate school, uh, in medical school uh, teaching. And he has very active research here. Yeah, Dr. Baroni, I think that's one of the most productive uh, researchers at SUNY Down State. So we welcome you. Thank you so much for the invitation. And we're very uh, happy that you uh, can teach us about the, uh, uh, this uh, stroke-based research. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk. And I uh, wish I had a little more time to get this polished. But this is what I have now uh, after the last week or so. so. Uh, this just shows a list of the scientists from downstate that have been involved. Uh, I have certainly, uh, you know, mentioned everyone involved in the in the work. But these are people, particularly from here, that have made an impact on the research. So I'm going to go through uh, several areas that are going to be able to cover uh, brain ischemia, hypoperfusion, and hypoxia effects on the brain. Uh, first, I'm going to start out with the pathophysiology of stroke and cerebrovascular disease. Then I'm going to go through intervention work uh, using thrombopoietin that highlights brain mechanisms in cerebrovascular disease induced vascular cognitive impairment, dementia, uh, and then dementia as related to mixed cerebrovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, including uh, Alzheimer's disease related disorders and new re research approaches. I'll be talking about two, two models primarily. Uh, one is ischemic stroke, where we do ischemic stroke uh, by directing either a suture or a clot into the external carotid artery so that it occludes the middle cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery collusion. The suture is uh, inserted and then withdrawn either uh, from 30 to uh, 30 minutes to two hours. Uh, and uh, we also have another model that we use, I'll talk about later, which is either transection or stenosis of the common carotid arteries, which represents the type of cerebral vascular disease, severe hypertension, diabetes, uh, associated changes in forebrain perfusion, also seen in Alzheimer's disease as well. So if we look at the, what happens in the brain associated with stroke, the occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. We're talking about several brain areas. There's normal brain. There's area in and around the primary core area that receives the reduced blood flow. Uh, that's uh, the penumbra. And you can see the difference in pH, decreased, and then decreased oxygen and glucose metabolic rates that occur uh, associated with this type of uh, blockage of flow. You can also represent 
the areas, the core and the penumbra using MRI, uh, perfusion weighted imaging provides a representation of the actual perfusion deficit, whereas DWI, uh, immediate decreased water movement occurs very quickly. It's an index of cytotoxic anemia and the cells are either uh, dead or soon to be dead that exhibit uh, uh, imaging associated with diffusion weighted imaging. And you can see this evolve over time. And so the idea is to get in there and salvage that for number. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this. It's, you can see it here. You, you can see that the uh, peak delay for perfusion weighted imaging encompasses quite a bit of the hemisphere. But then you can see that in the striatum, you begin to see the infarct early and then it extends into the cortex. And then over time, you can see this become completely matured by 24 hours. So that the, the striatum area is typically considered the core area here, quick injury, and then the cortex is the uh, salvageable area. Praz Salvin, who was chief resident here a, a, a while ago, uh, was very interested in how we could intervene beyond TPA when we started to be able to uh, withdraw, remove clots and how important that was. And now we're, we're getting efficacy out to 24 hours in some studies. And you don't necessarily need TPA for those studies. Actually, I just saw some work by uh, some deep Bangla uh, that uh, identified uh, uh, that more recently. So he was interested in delivering compounds to the ischemic brain when you remove the clot. And he did quite a bit of work establishing a model and some work in that area. And so let's take a look at what uh, early post-stroke ischemic pathology uh, looks like. Uh, reduced blood flow, glucose and oxygen deprivation, energy depletion, and then with that energy depletion, loss in membrane potential and failure to regulate membrane processes in general. There's a depolarization associated with external cellular potassium uh, and the ischemia. The excitotoxic stimulation is rampant. Uh, internal calcium goes up associated with this uh, release of transmitter. Free radicals grow up dramatically associated with mitre, mitochondrial dysfunction. The calcium activates many enzymes. Uh, free radicals can actually poke holes in the membranes themselves. Uh, enzyme activation degrades uh, the internal and external uh, uh, cell uh, processes resulting in uh, uh, necrosis and uh, apoptosis. Uh, if you take a look at the neurovascular unit changes associated with ischemia, as ischemia continues, oxidative stress, inflammatory cytokines, and secondary injury begins to occur associated with uh, matrix metalloproteinases that degrade the matrix, collagen and laminin and are associated with upregulation, just like excitatory, I mean, excuse me, uh, inflammatory cytokines uh, that are involved in the neuroinflammation process. There's a, a detachment of astrocytes from the blood vessels, also further dysregulation of, of blood flow, infiltration of leukocytes, that also some that can block blood flow in microvessels. And then again, these proteinases that can activate cell destruction internally and then also on the matrix in terms of MMPs. This is a, a postdoc at, at, at GlaxoSmithKline where I work, who, who did some work uh, following Gary Rosenbaum, who originally discovered MMP9 uh, associated with stroke. Uh, she did some work to try to understand not only whether or not uh, uh, an antibody could protect, but also if uh, uh, where it occurs. And she, she had seen it in the uh, uh, microvasculature on the endothelium and in neutrophils that were coming in uh, soon after stroke contributing to the injury. So we take a look at uh, the early aspects associated with the evolution of the penumbra into an infarct. If you take a look on the right side in the core, we see these immediate effects that occur very, very quickly associated with cytotoxic edemia and more rapid cell death. And then from the core, we see spreading depolarizations that can create more of these same problems in the area adjacent to the infarct, metabolic stress associated with this because it's low flow. 
and vascular mediators that are released, which is endothelin, which are very highly vasoconstrictive and are released in ischemia, not necessarily only in the brain, but in the brain, we've, we've, we've demonstrated that. And uh, then you, you see how this it can impact the penumbra, this upregulation of MMP9, inflammatory cytokines that are upregulated as a result of free radicals. Uh, and inflammatory cytokines that are upregulated associated with the same processes. Uh, neuronal and inflammatory nitric oxide synthase are upregulated dramatically so that you get a dysregulation and NO no longer regulates normally, it's dysregulated. And with the large amounts of NO present combining with free radicals, you get this uh, highly toxic uh, free radical peroxynitrite, which is devastating. So the process of necrosis and apoptosis uh, expanding the infarct, infarct is, is quite dramatic. And you have a time period that you have to worry about there that you can intervene within before the infarct, infarct is mature and you have nothing to protect. So taking this further and with a couple of illustrations, you can see that uh, the importance of matrix metalloproteases, uh, upregulation of uh, adhesion molecules, uh, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, microglia, activation, leukocyte infiltration, uh, results in this neuron glial cytotoxicity. At this late, a little bit later time, hours later, you start to get vasodilatic edema following the cytotoxic edema in the core and the expansion of the infarct uh, uh, over, over uh, hours to days. It depends on uh, the species. In, in rodents, it's, it's, it's over hours up to a days, maybe days in mice, and typically up to days in humans. And then you can see a process associated with inflammation that is important in restoration. Uh, these help in terms of uh, re repairing the brain. And the whole process of angiogenesis, neurogenesis, and synaptogenesis and ex axonal myelin repair is, is gonna be important for us in the future. I think we'll be able to learn more about how to intervene in that manner from some of the studies going on now and some of the cell-based work that had been going on in Mike Chop's lab. So this just is a uh, sort of an onion uh, representation of how uh, change in the brain are occurring and type of time periods that we have to intervene. Uh, I think I've already spent enough time on that. What can we, what can we really think about in terms of reducing uh, outcomes associated, improving outcomes associated with stroke? Uh, we can reduce risk factors or do something to do with preconditioning that might be very interesting that could protect, protect the brain if one were to occur. Once you get one, what do you do? There's nothing that can cannot be done in the primary core area. It's already injured too quickly. Uh, secondary injury, however, is where we have some opportunities, uh, intervening a vascular and neuroinflammatory effect, oxygen stress, uh, matrix metalloproteas. I showed you some preliminary uh, preclinical data demonstrating that it, it, it could be effective. And also uh, following up with healing and brain restoration, as I mentioned, is an opportunity to repair what has already been injured. So let me take this time now to talk about intervention work that highlights uh, brain mechanisms in the uh, VCID. I am gonna take two topics here, try to get to them quickly. I'm sorry I was late. Uh, TPO intervention in stroke, early intervention before the infarct is matured, showing that we can protect the brain, and then late intervention after the infarct is matured, showing that we can restore and recover function associated with angiogenesis. And then I'll talk a little bit about chronic forebrain hypoperfusion and white matter injury that produces a vascular cognitive impairment of dementia in, in uh, the rat. So, thrombo Wheaton, TPO. It's the hemopoietic factor. The most widely studied hemopoietic factor in terms of brain injury is erythropoietin, but there was some uh, data that have been identified from clinical work and then followed up in preclinical that was overlooked originally, showing that it increases MMP9, so it becomes a, a complication since MMP9 is involved in the stroke process and upregulating it uh, with something that we want to do, get in there with and protect the brain with. Uh, became problematic and they stopped the trial because of increased mortality. So uh, TPO operates through the TPO receptor. It's involved in cell proliferation survival, regulates platelets, of course, 
uh, it operates the intracellular pathways, JAK-STAT and MAP kinase and uh, AKT. It has multiple me uh, mechanisms for its efficacy. Uh, it has an homology with erythropoietin and uh, BDNF. It enhances in angiogenesis, it protects against hind limb ischemia, uh, potentiates endothelial progenitor cells, which can have a role in recovery. Uh, we show, it had been shown, actually Danny uh, Rosenbaum identified that it had shown uh, cardiac uh, protective effects, and therefore we, we decided to go after it for the brain. And we found that TPO protects brain vasculature in the brain by reducing neural inflammation and induce, that's induced by cerebrovascular disease, ischemia, and hypoxia. And I'll go through that data now. So Jin Zhao was from NIH and mentions Danny, Danny's role in all things, but in this particular initial work, he, he was the one who originated the idea, identified the original work. And then Jen. Uh, it had worked with us for years, and now she's in private practice, but she's highly missed. Uh, the effects that we, we, we looked at, we, we looked at a two-hour ischemia, uh, and then we reperfused for 22 hours in this study. Uh, we administered the effective dose. It's an unusual dose response curve. Probably one of the complications in taking it forward therapeutically is this particular nature here. We need to understand more about it. But I think we can understand what we're dealing with in this area and compare it to some other areas with some of the new technologies I'll talk about at the end. But again, it had no effect on platelets or hematocrit under, under these conditions at this dose that we utilized in these studies. We have a series of uh, sensory motor tests that we use and score. And then we have an additional footfall test used to monitor uh, motor impairment. And if you take a look at the infarct and brain swelling in the cortex and striatum, I mentioned the striatum evolved very quickly. We couldn't protect it. We saw it in the MRI image. But if you look at the cortex, we were able to protect that at 24 hours with this TPO intervention, two hours upon reperfusion and stroke. And we also protected from the football fault deficit and the uh, neurological sensory motor deficits. And we also saw that show that transcripts are upregulated associated with stroke in the PBS animals from sham uh, surgery animals for TNF and for IL-1 beta, I don't have uh, for the inflammatory cytokine and for the in inflammatory protein MMP9, as we were talking about, that's decreased by people, 24 hours. And we also see that the in addition to the transcripts being decreased by TPO, the protein itself was decreased and its activity was decreased. We also show that associated with these changes are protection of the blood-brain barrier under these conditions. You can see this is uh, Evans blue infusion and you can see it staining and you can see it quantitatively counted with a spec uh, showing that it's decreased. And if we follow these uh, neurobehavioral protective effects uh, over time, we see that it's long-term. Uh, in this study, we took it out to 28 days. And you can see that even after one day, we see the initial effect as I showed you, but then we see it persisting for the full time period. And we use a series of cognitive tests as well. Right now we're using primarily active place avoidance, which involves a series of trials uh, maybe one to seven trials, 10 minute trials where the animal's first adapted and then he's tested. Uh, and uh, he gradually learns to avoid a, a stationary stop, uh, shock zone, a quadrant that does not move it's stationary, but the platform itself moves and the animal learns to avoid that. Pass avoidance is not really used. It's not very sensitive to this type of brain, these types of brain injury, but teammates, and water maze assays to capture executive function and spatial navigation were used. And again, the sensory motor tests. This is an example of what happens in APA lear learning. The animal in the first trial uh, ends up in the shock zone, it gets shocked, but then it gradually learns uh, different types of strategy. Here he's just walking away and he only gets shocked once versus many, many times in the first trial on the seventh trial. 
This persists for a long time as well. Uh, Jim showed this over uh, up to 42 days. And you can see this dramatic reduction uh, in cognition as for sensory motor function associated with TIPA. We also showed that TIPA was effective in permanent embolic stroke, which is, was a requirement at the time to look at compounds that might be protective. Uh, permanent uh, uh, ischemia had to be utilized. So we see that uh, TPA had very little effect, which is not unlike what uh, we see in the clinic, but TIPO had dramatic effects and the combination of TIPO with TPA uh, did not result in any better effect, but it didn't cause the kind of problems that occurred with, in the clinic with the other erythropoietin. And then Jian Zhuang did a thesis uh, uh, project looking at the protective mechanism associated with TPO in the TPO receptor knockout mouse. Uh, we did a series of preliminary studies to demonstrate some similar shock sensitivity, stroke sizes, and APA learning uh, in, in the knockouts compared to wild types. And so we went forward, Jian uh, looked at a series of doses and identified an effective dose, but there was a marginal zone of efficacy, again, a problem with the dose response with TPO. But you can see that the only in the wild type animal do we see a decrease in the hemispheric infarction or in the hemispheric size, uh, not in the TPO receptor knockout mouse. And we also see that the sensory motor and cognitive protection only occurs in the wild type mouse. So it really is dependent upon the TPO receptor. TNF alpha expression in microvasculature and in microglia was decreased by TPO. MMP9 and diextravasation associated with blood brain barrier changes were only decreased in the wild type. So the TPO receptor is, is essential. Infiltration of leukocytes, early it's. Uh, neutrophils, later it's uh, monocytes, uh, was reduced only in the wild type. Microglia uh, activation only reduced in the wild type. So TIPO protects the brain by reducing stroke induced vascular and cellular inflammation, infiltrating leukocytes and endogenous microglia, and by reducing the matrix degradating MMP9 and resulting blood brain barrier injury. So protecting the vessels can protect the brain. And we wanted to look at the next step, which was to look at restoration associated with TPO because they knew there was some background data on protection and restoration associated with angiogenesis and via increased endothelial progenitor cells. Started out looking at a single dose and then we in, increase the two treatments uh, a dose at one in four days, again, using that effective dose. This was done by Kerry Poon, who's now at Amgen. Uh, forgot to mention that, that Gian is uh, currently at University of Illinois as a medical student since last year. And uh, Kerry started at Weill Cornell Mind Brain Institute as a postdoc after she left here, but she's been at Amgen just about a year now. You can see that uh, administering TPO after the infarct matured, as I mentioned much earlier, in these two doses indicated by the red arrows, you can see that there's a, a decrease over time in the sensory motor deficits due to TPO administration. And there's a, an improved cognition that occurs out to a month later associated with the early TPO intervention. How is it happening? Well, we think we had an easiest started to look at was angiogenesis because we could look at a process and also maybe look at blood flow in that area where we see the process. So we had a way of uh, complementing the scientific data that we, we could go forward with. So uh, angiogenesis can be associated with improvements in functional outcome and TPO has been shown to increase it. So Terry looked at CD31 immunohistochemical labeled microglia and looked at uh, perivascular 
microvascular density, perinfarct microvascular density. And this is what the uh, stained microvessels look like. And we looked at them at three different locations uh, in the forebrain to be confident in the data that we didn't just catch it at one point. Uh, and you can see where she looked at associated with the uh, border of the infarct. And if she looks at that microvascular density at one week, excuse me, at four weeks after, you can see that TIPO has provided an increase back to what you'd see without an infarct uh, in that area, in these, in these animals, compared to a dramatic loss in the ischemic hemisphere of these microvessels area infarct. So we, ne we needed to look at a process that was involved in this angiogenesis that had occurred and persisted there uh, following infarction. And we looked at VGF in the first uh, couple of weeks, and we looked at uh, the combination of angiopoietin-1 and PDGRF receptor beta, double labeling to characterize pericytes involved in angiogenesis. So we looked at one week VGF, and you can see on the left, lower, lower left, uh, that we started to see an increase above uh, what, 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 what you would see with PBS due to TPO of, these, uh, of VGF even at one week. And by two weeks, we only saw the, the spontaneous that occurred in, 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 with stroke at one week was lost, but the uh, TPO persisted in maintaining that increase in VGF. And of course, VGF is involved in endothelial cell sprouting, proliferation tube formation, but angiopoietin, one in the labeling of parasites, co-labeling them, allowed us to look at the angiogenic process in more detail. And we looked at that at one week, where we see that both are down in reference to no stroke at one week, but with TIPO, we start to get an increase at two weeks in these in the process, demonstrating that the process was going on. If we looked at blood flow, we show that blood flow in that peri infarct region was increased, showing some functional consequence that could be associated with the improved cognition associated with the TIPO administration. Much more needs to be looked at here, but this was a, a, a very interesting finding. And so if we look at uh, cerebral vascular disease and stroke, BCI, mixed brain pathology can be associated with microinfarcts, microhemorrhages. It's associated with vascular risk, uh, diabetes, severe hypertension, as in Ben Slinger's disease, large vessel carotid artery disease, and certainly lubricariosis, periventricular white matter hyperintensity that's observed in cerebral vascular disease. But it, infarcts themselves only account for about 25% of the variance in cognitive loss in adults. So we, we know there's other things involved and we need to have the models to try to understand what those might be. I mentioned how long stroke effects occur in terms of cognitive uh, deficits. We know that there's an interaction uh, between uh, Alzheimer's disease and the pathway to dementia and vascular cognitive impairment uh, and cerebral vascular disease induced changes. We've talked about some of the processes associated with what goes on in ischemia and hypoxia and uh, how that process interacts with A beta toxicity. And if phospho phosphorylation of tau via activated microglia might be involved, they're all questions we are interested in in this process because the co-diagnosis of uh, uh, cerebral vascular disease and uh, Alzheimer's disease is quite prevalent and uh, suggests that there's an interaction going on that we, we need to better understand. So we are involved in support and also in organizing. And you can see some key people here, Deb, Howard, Herman, and Allison involved in this uh, think tank on cerebral vascular disease, cognitive impairment and dementia that started back as early as 2015, but the planning went on much earlier. Uh, we wanted to create 
yearly workshops. And we actually got to the point after several workshops where I identified white marker, white matter as a, a focus of the uh, Albert Research Institute for White Matter and Cognition, which was uh, actually established just last year. Uh, we're continuing with these meetings. Uh, we help to fund uh, fellows, uh, students, and also really bring together and, and publish yearly on new discoveries and opportunities uh, in uh, vascular cognitive impairment dementia. So uh, going to the other models of hypoperfusion uh, where we can transect or stenose, uh, we're, we're actually looking at some of this stuff now with models of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Gloria, who I'll, I'll refer to later, is, is doing unilateral occlusions in mice. Uh, we have done some work in mice where we've done bilateral stenosis. Uh, where the studies I'll be talking about are bilateral stenosis in uh, spontaneously hypertensive rats to include a vascular risk as part of this. Here's, here's the way we do it. We uh, uh, stenose the common carotid arteries uh, in, in duplicate uh, at, at using a, 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 a needle uh, size that allows us to work for both rats or mice. This was established over a period of time to understand what, what to use and how to do this. And uh, in our first studies, we really were very, very much surprised just how dramatic the effects were on active place avoidance. And you can see, see six weeks post-surgery, you see this dramatic decrease in shocks and entries that observed in a stroke uh, it, compared to sham stroke. We also showed that if we uh, develop an assay for executive function using the TMAs, we, we can also show that similar to what you see for executive function in man, you see an inability to uh, execute uh, provide execute executive functioning uh, as well. And some of the gate balance deficits that you see going on in, in human VCI, you can also see, but we didn't see any general motor effects or other sensory motor uh, behavioral effects or effects on the already hypertensive uh, blood pressure in the, in the spontaneous and hypertensive rats. But we looked at it for long periods of time to pursue cysts out here 22 weeks as long as we, we, we followed the animals, but you can see it gets gradually worse over time. In fact, it, more errors are made as time goes on. Substantial cognitive impairment. We also used the Morris water maze and showed cognitive impairment uh, associated with learning acquisition. Uh, we, had, we established a baseline, and at four weeks, we already started to see the separation and at 12 weeks of persistent. Uh, Shadinma Anyanwu uh, is now in, uh, in London uh, doing research and, and studying. Uh, she was a fellow. She's also uh, demonstrated that the uh, actual memory was impaired dramatically. <laughs> and the working mem memory test was also uh, impaired. So it did reveal quite a bit about the processes going on under these conditions in addition to what APA shows. But Manan, who is uh, actually uh, now working at the, uh, uh, in, in pediatrics here in New York City, associated with Downstate. And you, you can see that he, he looked at neurons and he also looked at MRI following this with Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And he showed that the neurons were not affected in, in vulnerable, uh, areas of the brain like the uh, CA1 and CA3. And so it, 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 it suggested that something else was involved. And so we looked at white matter, the corpus callosum, and we show a, a dramatic a decrease in staining. And if we look at immunofluorescence of uh, myelin-based protein using an antibody, we show, that, we show that that was dramatically impaired under this condition due to stenosis. This is a period of time out, down 22 weeks when it's animal. animals are sacrificed. And if we looked at pre oligos, something's disrupted about their ability to come in and perhaps repair over time. And it could be associated with the persistent 
hypoperfusion that's going on that actually uh, uh, Menon did demonstrate. If you take a look at the upper right-hand graph, you can see that perfusion associated with uh, flow measured uh, using MRI uh, was decreasing the cortex and the corpus callosum. Not much effect on metabolism, but if you look at diffusion tensor imaging in A in the left side, you can see that there's a dramatic or significant decrease uh, in the FA rational anesthetoscopy. And, and that su suggests there's a disruption in the microenvironment. We don't know what that disruption is yet. We think that needs to be investigated. It's probably associated with the in increased uh, demyelination and increased uh, inflammation that's occurring in this area. I'll show you a second. Here's the inflammation. In the corpus callosum, you can see there's an astrogliosis and a microgliosis that's quite significant. And it was at this point where we saw this phenomena and we were dealing with the uh, Albert Trust Research Institute for White Matter and Cognition. This formation sort of drove us to uh, complete this process as a group. And we discussed it at the meeting and agreed to this uh, together uh, with, among the experts uh, in, in the area. So we've done some work looking at TIPO, looking at stenosis uh, in mice. And we see a significant effect. We have to do more. This is in the rat. And we've also established that it can be used to, to work in the mouse. We're doing uh, now unilateral, as I mentioned, uh, for that. So I did already mention uh, that we did form this uh, institute. And then uh, the last part of this, I just want to talk a little bit about dementia as it's related to uh, mixed cerebral vascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, and some new research approaches that are, are I think are going to really help us understand the disease biology involved. Uh, and that refers to uh, deep sequencing and transcriptomics. So I'm, I just became part of the uh, DCID uh, group that's evaluating NIH, NINDS, uh, what's going on in terms of research approaches that can be looked at and are needed to better understand the dementia. The dementia, dementia that can be due to multiple uh, pathways and multiple disorders, okay? Uh, we already went through some of the lifestyles. They're even interested in not only aging, genetic factors, uh, et cetera, but health disparities, nomenclature, trying to uh, really understand how best to talk about it, how best to understand what to do as a, as a network nationally that will make an impact on dementia, uh, which is going to be a very difficult problem to overcome. It already is, so we don't really have much, but uh, it's going to get worse as time goes on. So NINDS and NIA, uh, the, they're conducting these summits, you know, as I mentioned, creating a national plan. We really need a mechanistic understanding to improve protection of uh, these related disorders in the aging population and know how to address them. Uh, what are the clinical uh, syndromes and brain pathologies associated with these uh, uh, multiple etiologies? multiple investigations to provide pathological and clinical characterization, biomarker work that's needed, mechanisms involved, validation of new targets for intervention, ultimately result, could result in therapeutic approaches to st stop, delay, or, or reverse dementia. These are all hopes at this point, but we need a national plan and a, and a strategy to be able to do this. So I'll just go through some recent data that came out of Herman Moreno's lab. Uh, we all so, so much miss our beloved Herman. Uh, he, he did so much. Uh, we, we worked with him uh, so closely. This is just a picture of Herman uh, when he was taking his lab out. This is Gloria, who's doing a lot of work now. Uh, uh, Ivan Hernandez has really taken over for Herman on all this work when Herman got sick and during all that period. And so 
he and I are working uh, closely together on many different aspects of cerebral vascular disease, stroke, and vascular cognitive impairment now. So this particular study, uh, we, we looked at small vessel cerebral vascular disease. We visualized white matter hyperintensities and looked at the contributions to the clinical pr presentation of AD. In the human, we examined association between white matter hyperintensity, plasma tau, and we determined if white matter hyperintensity did uh, interact with tau levels in the diagnosis of AD. We showed that uh, it, human uh, white matter hyperintensity was associated with higher plasma tau. Uh, we also showed that the presence of brain amyloid and the interaction between plasma tau and white matter hyperintensity did distinguish Alzheimer's disease and white matter and mild cognitive impairment from controls. And this was all done with, uh, in Col at Columbia, uh, where we had the collaborative work done. We did all the preclinical work, the basic science work here. High degrees of atherosclerosis were associated with higher breath staging, indicating a positive relationship between cerebrovascular disease and neurofibrillary pathology. And then in mice, mice, we took it to the stroke level where we used stroke as a cerebrovascular disease model but in, in this study, stroke, but not sham surgery, exhibited increased plasma, cerebral spinal fluid, tau concentrations, and a significant induction of myelin, reduction, it, reduction in myelin loss and hyperphosphorylated tau pathology in the uh, its lateral hippocampus and cerebral hemisphere. And also there was a potential causal association was supported overall by the demonstration that TMCIO induces white matter damage, increased biofluid markers of tau and promotes cerebral tau hyperphosphorylation uh, in mice. This is one representative photomicrograph showing that uh, you get an increased loss in myelin if, as you increase from 30 to 60 minutes and also an increased uh, phosphorylation of tau in the hippocampus. If you look at the corpus callosum, you can see this dramatic decrease it's with 60 minutes of MCAO in the uh, mouse. It's just a wild type mouse. You can see that below the sham surgery, the above the TMCAO is really lost. So, so, so myelin and white matter is injured loss. And you can see that uh, using an, another approach to look at phosphorylated tau, uh, you see an increase in uh, phosphorylated tau associated with 60 minutes. And then if we look at uh, six, 60 minutes, 30 minutes, and sham surgery, we see that there's, an there's a nice correlation associated with CSF and plasma tau. And that between CSF and plasma tau, and then we also see uh, a significant increase in CSF and plasma tau uh, at, at 60 minutes. And this work was done in collaboration. All the human work was done with Adam Brickman and Jose Lusinger at Columbia University. And the research and the funding was obtained uh, by Herman and myself with uh, Jose. And so, here, here you can see that we're looking at the subtypes of microglia associated with uh, ischemia. And we can show that within those cells using double labeling that we can up, show an upregulation of TNF in those uh, upregulated microglia or activated microglia, suggesting that's of the M1 inflammatory phenotype. And there's this uh, whole series of studies we went through, Allison Baird and I did, uh, these, this work and tried to create neuronal uh, endothelial uh, oligocyte uh, and cell stress models to be able to understand this in more detail, to understand M1 and M2 signaling. We, we created these, these models and we went through uh, trying to understand if TIPO might affect the, pol the polarity or the uh, phenotypic profile showing a more inflammatory and a, and a less inflammatory and a more uh, anti-inflammatory 
uh, profile. But uh, it's very difficult work. It's it, it's use it, it's useful, but it doesn't tell us. It's we have to create conditions and mimic a disease processes. Whereas uh, it's important to maybe test specific hypotheses on mechanisms. But it's the dark ages for trying to get new knowledge out of systems and disease biology. So uh, we're we're moving now to RNA or single nucleotide, RNA-seq, and uh, spatial transcriptomes, which is now available and really required for this kind of work. Single nucleus, uh, nucleus RNA sequencing uh, makes measurements of cellular composition and gene expression dynamics of the human brain at a single cell re 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 resolution. You can bring it to single cell utilizing the new uh, spatial transcriptomics associated work with things like RNA scope, where you can take individual transcripts and double label them inside cells. There's, there's all kinds of uh, beautiful work that can be done under these conditions. The uh, different data bases are available for comparison of your work too. Uh, there's the Allen Brain cell type database. Uh, there's the Brain Research uh, Initiative. Uh, that has uh, databases available. So now we can, <clears throat> we can learn how disorders and diseases are related to certain cell types. We can help understand the cellular mechanisms underlying cerebrovascular and neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric diseases or the physiology and pathophysiology in cells and in any organs from human cells. We can even look at circulating cells and uh, evaluating evaluate what's it happened associated with different occurrences in animals and man. I'm starting this work with Oleg, uh, who is primarily at the Institute for Genomic Health and with uh, Jenny Libyan, and also in collaboration with Mark uh, Mailer, Chair of Neurology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. We're trying to, uh, we started out with COVID studies where we were gonna use these approaches uh, looking at RNA scope to characterize uh, transcripts of the virus and then look at areas in and around the virus and the types of microglia and activation of neuroinflammation that might be associated with the uh, COVID-19 symptoms, neurologic symptoms that were associated with this. And we're trying to establish uh, sources for those particular infected individuals. We started to do that. We've got a couple samples in already and started to look at that. But we're also looking at Alzheimer's disease under these conditions, and we're going to be moving into cerebrovascular disease uh, stroke to try to do these types of studies. Uh, but let's just talk about what, could, what has already been started to emerge associated with transcriptomics and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I mentioned single nucleotide RNA-C. Uh, this could be cell or nucleotide, but in frozen tissue, it's mostly from the nucleus, which is adequate to look at uh, uh, LEA uh, labeled RNA uh, sequences. And if you look at these particular labels that have been spatially tagged, you can look at them in the original brain sections where they occurred, utilizing the appropriate uh, Illumina uh, sequencing and follow up with. Uh, uh, bioinformatics and computer processing that's available through you know, uh, 10x genomics operation. But you can look at this in Alzheimer's disease. It's already been started. You can look at the relationship between changes in cells associated with plaques or tangles. And we can take this type of approach, looking at that with phosphorylated tau and some of our cerebrovascular disease models and with our combined models of uh, cerebral vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease. And you take single cell or nucleus gene expression can be characterized and, and you can show differential expression. You can look at the spatial gene expression by laying out these sections of actual brain tissue on these special visium slides that have these areas and 50 microns that have these primers that can attach to the RNA sequences that are uh, 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 captured after the cells are permeabilized uh, uh, on the sections above these slides. On these slides, the sections are above on these particular uh, parts of the slide. 
that have all these primers uh, attached to, and there are and they apply and they have labels that are attached to them that can tag them for that location, so you can get and resolve uh, where they are located. The upper right of this slide shows how that might be done, and you can actually see them. And the upper and the lower right shows how this can be merged together with uh, immunohistochemistry to identify cell types and what's going on. So you can actually look at phenotypic changes associated with what's going on in areas where you previously labeled. And in this study, they looked at uh, immuno, uh, immunohistochemical uh, labeling of plaques and then looked in and around and, and analyzed cell changes. And not only that, looking at differential transcripts and their expression associated uh, with disease under these conditions, they were able to use uh, bioinformatics in uh, looking at these signaling systems that were important associated with the changes in gene expression. And it's very interesting that the uh, complement cascade associated with synaptic loss in Alzheimer's disease and oxidative stress we know is involved in ischemia, uh, lysosomal pathways and cell folding, uh, protein folding, important in the disease and the immune response and the neuro neurovascular information inflammation I think is so important in, in neurodegenerative and cerebrovascular disease. Uh, so there's the, these plaque induced genes that, that were processed and analyzed from a, uh, a bioinformatics point of view, to come up with this is a nice, a, a, a nice paper. There's several others now, but there, it's, only, it's only begun in Alzheimer's disease. There's really nothing out there in cerebrovascular disease induced uh, vascular cognitive impairment of dementia, and, and we want to uh, be people that are involved in that uh, process. So to, to briefly summarize cerebrovascular disease models of focal ischemia and hypoperfusion exhibit long-term deficits in cognitive function. Hypoperfusion results in hypoxia and produces a brain environment similar to that in focal ischemic stroke penumbra with a resulting injury and pathology more selective for white matter, at least in some models, we can show this. Vascular injuries associated with gliovascular inflammation, endothelial cell, astrocytic, and microglia activation, and white matter injury, demyelination. We, need, we think we can understand more about this. Even things like endothelial cell and vascular aging may be very important to help elucidate some of these effects. And, um, there's, there's just a universe multi-universe even, of things that can be looked at under these conditions if we start to go down to the uh, transcriptome and then into the proteome level to look at this. Uh, protection of vasculature and reducing gliovascular inflammation can protect the brain from CVD-induced impaired cognition, highly inflammatory M1 and, M and the anti-inflammatory M2 microglia might be targets that can improve functioning. We need to understand more about that. Again, endothelium oligocytes and astrocytes, they need to be better understood. And this has all uh, been brought up by the uh, NIMDS and uh, National Institute of Aging groups that are looking at uh, BCID and strategies to impact dementia. The cell work is important. However, RNA-seq, the spatial transcriptomics with cellular transcript, phenotypic cross-validation, that can better understand molecular and cellular changes and the interactions in these diseases are important. And this approach can be extended into signaling pathways and protein verifications to validate new targets for intervention. This has begun for AD, as I mentioned, but it's waiting for use in DCID alone and together for some of the AD uh, plus DCID work and to get new AD knowledge uh, that I, I mentioned we're, we're working on now. So we need to increase our investment in these technologies in the Institute of Genomic Health facilities at Downstate. Uh, I think we really need to do that. Uh, it, it, this can be for use by the faculty and student teaching. We can beef it up so that we can uh, involve it in our disease biomarker research. Uh, importantly, it can apply to circulating or cultured cells and tissues in controls, human disease and animal models in any given area of study. So the power here can be a real plus for downstate and we need that investment. 
And that's all I have to say this morning. Sorry, I was a little late. Man, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Baron, and that's a wonderful lecture. It was uh, really nice to see your uh, work and actually the direction of it. Uh, we're gonna have some very limited time for questions, but uh, if there's further questions, you can also like email Dr. Baron and also if you are interested to work with him also, to, I think he's pretty open also. Uh, any questions from the audience at this point? Uh, yes, uh, this is Tony Wang, Frank. It's uh, amazing work. Um, I'm truly, uh, um, really, a, you know, um, amazed by the uh, the breadth and also the depth of the work you you have done, um, touching upon a very um, almost very elusive subject of the um, cognitive impairments associated with cerebrovascular disease. Um, I'm particularly um, interested in your uh, experiment with the tau um, level expression levels in the um, ischemia model, uh, where you observed uh, rapid and and also dramatic increase of the tau expression uh, post ischemia. Um, are you surprised that uh, that tau expression changed so quickly in uh, to the level that you uh, detected? And how does that? That, that, was at, that was at 15 days. Okay. Oh, oh 15 days, not not, okay. not a day. It take, uh, it, I, it, I thought it was four hours, know, six hours. Don't know the time course yet. You know, we, ah. we know. there have been others that have done uh, that was in stroke. There have been others, in fact, Gary Rosenberg, who actually discovered MMP9 in stroke. Uh, he had done some work with the hypoperfusion model that I had mentioned we had gone through in rat, and he had meant he had identified phosphorylated tie in the uh, cortex of those animals as well. And the whole idea that a beta or phosphorylated tau can be somehow involved in cerebral vascular disease, which is co uh, diagnosed in AD, is uh, intriguing and probably important to really understand in more detail. So that's sort of where we're coming from on this to, to understand more about that. We, we think that neurovascular inflammation is involved in the process of phosphorylation in, in tau. We don't know how yet, but we think we can, might be able to understand it if we can look at it in these sections of tissue and maybe cross-validated in human uh, stroke. Uh, all this work that can be done with transcriptomics can now be done in uh, paraffin uh, and uh, embedded uh, formal and thick slides as well. So there's opportunities to look at uh, translational comparisons between human and animal data. So, that, I mean, it is quite powerful and, and, and it probably doesn't happen immediately. Even Gary Rosenberg's work was, was at many weeks after the animals had received hypoperfusion. Right, I was a little confused about four hours, six hours. I thought it was the uh, time you, you, you uh, well, was, detected. Yeah. Yeah. That was um, 30 minutes or Right, in terms of the levels um, of expression of tau uh, at those levels, does it compare to some other, including the CSF, does it compare to the known AD models? Do you have any uh, tests to see what are the levels fetch it to, or to what percentage of that to the we known AD a, models? Herman ordered a uh, hyperphosphorylated mouse model so we could cross validate it in that condition. And he was able to do that, but that's already constitutively upregulated in the animal as it becomes uh, mature. So mm -hmm. uh, we need to look at the interaction of the model that we do have is the APP mouse, and that's really an amyloid mouse. So uh, there are some different types of models, and that's one of the uh, NINDS and uh, NIA. Uh, 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 request is to look at multiple models to try to understand, you know, how we can understand what's happening in man because no animal model uh, recapitulates, you know, what happens in man, you know, all encompassing. So, yeah, those are good questions. I don't have the answers at this point. Thank you, Frank. We appreciate that. Amazing work. Uh, 
So I think just for uh, constraints of time, we're gonna uh, need to like uh, finish our like run runs today. Uh, but uh, uh, please, if you have any questions for Dr. Brown, just say in a message. Uh, and uh, if you need the uh, information for uh, how to contact him, you can just uh, email me also or to downstream neurology at gmail.com or Sergio Tatangulo, and I can refer to Dr. Brownis. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brown, to like uh, show us this. Uh, uh, this will work, it is amazing. And thank you for the audience also. And we'll see you in the next Friday. Yes, thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.